Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us today for this UN Day of observance of the impacts of drought and desertification. The message is clear. The leading driver of desertification and land degradation is humanity's relentless production and consumption of natural resources. My name is Janusz Potocznik and I am a co-chair of UNEP International Resource Panel. The panel works to demonstrate that resource use represents the nexus of drivers that impacts the Earth through land degradation, biodiversity loss and climate warming. Our presentation today will have three parts. Firstly, I will give an overview of the IRP perspective of the linkages between land and resource consumption. Secondly, my fellow panel member Jeff Herrick will speak about results of IRP work showing that matching land use more effectively with land potential is one of the most effective and simplest strategies for decoupling human development and economic growth from land degradation. And finally, we have a short video describing the key findings of the IRP report about land restoration and the SDGs. Dear friends, while the COVID crisis has made us recognize the importance of ecosystem services and resource dependence more clearly, it has not fundamentally changed the main risks to human well-being and the priorities to pursue. Smarter resource management focused on societal well-being and fair access to vital resources, particularly for the world's most vulnerable people. In short, the SDGs and Paris Agreement are as crucial as ever. Reaching them still needs a fundamental transition of economic incentives and international cooperation. Some are saying that the world after COVID-19 will not be the same again. It will be the same. We will just understand it better. We face the emergence of a single tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. We are more interconnected and interdependent than ever. And the frequency and severity of health-related outbreaks, climate-related extreme weather events, will in the future very likely increase. We need to be better prepared and more resilient. We need to improve our risk management. We therefore need to drive a resource smart recovery, generating social and economic value while safeguarding the environment. And that is why nature-based solutions and their impact on the use of land must be at the heart of an inclusive, sustainable economic recovery. The Global Resource Outlook, published by IRP last year, demonstrated the system's impact of natural resource use. Extraction and processing of natural resources alone cost 90% of global land-related biodiversity loss and water stress in 2017, and over 50% of climate change impacts. Global economic growth has been a main driver for global resource use, to more than triple since 1970. Resource use is highly unequal around the world. Based on material footprint, high-income countries consume about 13 times more material resources than low-income countries. We also know that almost 30% of global land is today degraded. Land restoration is an essential part in helping livelihoods prosper and the powerful solution addressing climate change and water security. The good news is that IRP research demonstrates the change is possible and provides clear path to achieve SDG 15 life on land. For an efficient use of land, it is crucial to apply an integrated landscape approach to planning that considers matching the use of land with the sustainable potential and thereby getting the best economic and health outcome for particularly vulnerable communities. To protect and avoid further land degradation, we must encourage the establishment of property and tenure rights regimes for natural resources, particularly for indigenous peoples. For a resource-efficient food system, we have to be more efficient, both in the ways we produce and consume food, on the consumption side, this includes investing into plant-based proteins, significantly reducing waste and recycling nutrients. On the production side, we should be investing in new farming technologies such as well-placed drip irrigation or low-till and precision farming. All of this will contribute to increasing productivity and lower nitrogen losses and water use. I have no time to mention many of other measures which should also play a role but one still deserves to be mentioned, the use of textiles. 
The global apparel and footwear industries are accounting for an estimated 8% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, and this is set to increase 49% by 2030 if current trends continue. The current linear system of the textile industry is wasteful. Changing it to a more circular one holds the potential for considerable reductions in environmental impact. A forthcoming UNEP report undertakes a global stock take on sustainable and circularity in the textile value chain and identifies social and environmental impacts and hotspots along the value chain. IRP is working with UNEP to build good evidence and quantitative analysis to support the necessary transition. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not have a lot of time, but we have many opportunities to change the way we use our land for food, for feet, and for fiber. We know it is possible to decouple our resource use from the economic development. Let's seize this moment in history, let's act now, and let's make it happen. Jeff will now illustrate the results of two IRP reports that respond to this challenge. Hello, my name is Jeff Herrick, and I'm a soil scientist with the USDA's Agricultural Research Service and a member of the International Resource Panel. Matching land use with its sustainable potential is one of the most fundamental actions we can take to ensure that we are able to provide for human needs for food, fiber, and clean water. A key strategy is to produce crops where there is a low risk of land degradation and where the land is sufficiently resilient that it can quickly recover if degradation does occur. This is especially important in dry lands, like where I'm standing today in the Western United States. Nearly 90 years ago, there was a drought on the plains to the east of me. Crops failed and a massive wave of migrants left their farms and began migrating west over these mountains to California. When they settled their land a few years earlier, they did not realize that it could only support crop production during relatively wet years. Today, we have the knowledge necessary to balance our consumption with what the land can support and avoid the land degradation and social dislocation that the United States experienced during its Dust Bowl of the 1930s. For example, this soil here is too coarse and full of stones to hold enough water to support crop production, even in a wetter climate than we have here. I can determine the type of soil and how healthy it is using relatively simple tests that can be learned from a local extension agent or in mobile apps like the Land Potential Knowledge System or Land PKS. The amount of water the soil will hold depends on its texture or how much sand, silt, and clay it has. A sandy soil will not even form a ball, while a clay soil will form a ribbon. As you can see, this soil, once it is moistened, will form a ball, but it's very difficult for me to form a ribbon. This soil has more silt and clay than sand on a beach, but not as much as other soils. While this land cannot support crop production, it is sustainably grazed by both livestock and wildlife. Grazing also reduces fire danger, which is especially important because this pasture is adjacent to a city and this ecosystem is adapted to fire. However, sustainably grazing this land also requires an understanding of its potential production. Stocking rates, or the number of livestock per unit area, are set much lower here than they are on nearby pastures with better soils. Even within this pasture, we see differences in production and in the types of plant species that can survive and prosper. These differences in soils, climate, and the slope of the land also determine which land restoration strategies will be effective. More information on managing land to its sustainable potential is available in the IRP report unlocking the sustainable potential of land resources. The following animated video summarizes the conclusions of a second report, Land Restoration for Achieving the SDGs. Imagine a group of people lived on the land. They grew food and raised animals, and their children could go to school. 
However, due to a mismatch between land use and its sustainable potential, the land started to degrade. Their farm could no longer grow food as it did before. Everyone became hungry and poor, and eventually they had to move to other lands or to cities. The same story can be heard around the world. Some 25% of the world's land is degraded. It is impacting the well-being of 3.2 billion people globally. That is two out of every five people. Land restoration is one of the three key strategies that can help solve the problem and improve life on land. It can also have significant co-benefits for all the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. For example, it can increase water infiltration into the soil, which can then increase land productivity and create more income and food. This can reduce poverty, hunger, and improve health and opportunities for education. More and better quality of water can also be accessed. With all these, people who are forced to migrate may be able to come back to the productive land. The extent of restoration co-benefits and the potential risks and trade-offs vary widely among the SDGs and their respective targets. The co-benefits of the process of restoration and restored lands are also different for each SDG. To maximize opportunities across multiple SDGs, the International Resource Panel proposes four strategies. First, complete holistic and systematic analyses to identify potential synergies and trade-offs. Second, apply a landscape approach to planning and implementation. Third, develop targeted solutions adapted to different parts of the landscape and taking into account unique social, environmental, and economic contexts. And fourth, invest in areas where persistence is likely. When it comes to land restoration investments, we are so used to the conventional approach where we often address different objectives, such as agricultural production and biodiversity conservation, independently. Instead, we need an integrated landscape approach. It considers variable land potential and is designed by and responsive to all the stakeholders involved. And to maximize total return, we should target research and investments to those parts of the landscape that are most likely to respond and where recovery is likely to persist. In this way, we can ensure that we identify and realize the multiple potential benefits a land restoration project can bring about for the Sustainable Development Goals. Learn more about land restoration through the IRP's publication, Land Restoration for Achieving the Sustainable Development Goals at www.resourcepanel.org reports. Ladies and gentlemen, the International Resource Panel aims to focus on the nexus of all resource use, taking a holistic view of the global system that supports us. By doing this, we focus our research efforts on the primary drivers of climate warming, biodiversity loss, pollution, water scarcity and land degradation. And they all lead back to the way we use our natural resources. Let's take this opportunity to decouple economic growth and well-being from resource use and environmental impacts. And let's create a new economic and social paradigm to secure a safe and prosperous future for humanity. Take care and thank you for listening.